Wow. I know about y'all, but I never get tired of this. And reading it was even a better treasure. Um, I'm Carolyn Oscar. For those of you who I have yet to meet, I'm the Assistant News and Human Services Services here. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Know It All Reads. Um, this is something I do. I um, this is something I've wanted to do for a long time, and I cannot tell you how many books I have read trying to come up with the perfect one to start this. I will also confess that it was standing there, staring me right in the face. I mean, if you find a better book that brings out current themes, we've got um, justice, we've got race relations, we've got poverty, we've got economics, we've got class, all packed into one powerful small book. I hope you all enjoy reading it. It's our pleasure to bring it to you. Um, before I introduce our panel tonight, and we have an amazing panel here, I want to put in a plug for you to read. Um, I've been there. I can remember being in law school. I can remember thinking my eyeballs were going to fall out if I had to read one more case. Um, so I'm sympathetic. I can also say I practiced for a number of years, and I can remember coming home late at night and looking at the novel that I had on my bedside table and thinking, yeah, not tonight. Really? No. And even tonight when I go home, I think the, the, the pile of reading that I have on my bedside table it just sort of grows exponentially. But it is such a valuable tool. It takes us away. It gives us an escape into something new and different. It gives us a way of seeing something different. <laughs> it promotes creativity. Um, it just makes us well-rounded. And um, Brian Garner, <coughs> those of you who saw the article in Last Fall's ABA Journal, he, he's on a crusade and I'd like to join him. We need to be reading more. We need to be expanding our horizons. So I really want to challenge all of you. Find some time. I don't care what it is. We've got the escape hatch. Um, we've got the um, <laughs> labor has a variety of just read arounds. We've got the snap <coughs> program that can bring you news and information. Find some time in your day. It's there. You just have to reach out. Okay, so now that I've made my plug, a public service announcement. I want to introduce our panelists tonight. Um, we've got um, four amazing gentlemen up here. Um, when I <laughs> excuse me, when I looked at their accolades, I was just like, "Wow, how lucky can we get?" So let me start with somebody who spent 39 years here at WNL, more than 39 years. Um, professor Lash Larue. Um, he is um, the professor of law emeritus here at WNL. He is a former director of the Francis Lewis Law Center. Um, he is a 1959 graduate of WNL and then a 1962 graduate of Harvard Law School. He um, has an expertise in constitutional law and the judiciary, and his classes that he has taught here have ranged um, from evidence to election law. He's spanned the gamut. Uh, he's admitted to the Virginia Bar. He served as a legal officer in the U.S. Marines, as well as a trial attorney with the Department of Justice. He's got over 50 articles, as well as several books, including The Constitutional Law as a Fiction, Narrative and the Rhetoric of Authority, and a Case Study of the Watergate Affair. So welcome to Professor LaRue. Um, <coughs> our next panelist is a gentleman who I don't think needs introduction, but I'm going to do that, Professor Jim Molitierna. He is the Vincent Bradford Professor of Law here at the Law School. He teaches um, a variety of classes, including civil procedure and professional responsibility. He is a native of Ohio, attending Young State University, and he earned his JD from the University of Akron. Um, prior, to joining, uh, prior to joining us here at WNL, he was at that law school sort of down 64, I think they met what is William & Mary, y'all may have heard of it. Um, there he, uh, <laughs> Excuse me, not only um, was a professor of law, but he um, held a number of clinical and administrative positions, including that of the vice dean. He is a renowned expert, literally worldwide, in legal ethics, um, and he has lectured and tra trained um, lawyers, judges, and professors in Armenia, Georgia, Gi Ch um, Japan, China, Indonesia, Spain, and Thailand. He is the author and co-author of at least 10 books, and including his latest two, The American Legal Profession in Crisis, which is published by Oxford, and Global Issues in Legal Ethics. So welcome to Professor Molitarina. And from across the, um, the, the other side, we have two distinguished members of the um, college faculty. Um, Dr. Connor, who is also serving in the office of the um, Associate Provost, 
He is officially the Joe M. and James Balanchi Professor of English. Um, he has been a member of the WNL English Department since 1996, and he served as head of that department before he became our Associate Provost uh, most recently in July of 2013. He holds bachelor's, bachelor's degrees in English and Philosophy from the University of Washington, as well as master's and doctorates in English Literature from Princeton. His areas of research and expertise include 20th century American fiction, African American literature, literature and philosophy, and literature and religion. He teaches a range of classes and seminars, including Shakespeare, modern Irish literature, and the modern American novel. He is both a university leader and a scholar. He has served as the director of academic programs, such as the program in African American studies, the spring term, and the interdisciplinary study abroad program for Ireland. I want to go to that one. <laughs> <laughs> His publications include books on literary greats such as Shakespeare, Tony Morrison, James Joyce, and articles examining the work of Thomas Pynchon, Charles Johnson, and Ralph Ellison. Um, and last but not least is Professor Ted Delaney. Um, Professor Delaney is, has a long history here at WNL. He's a Lexington native, as well as a cum laude graduate. Um, he also holds his PhD in history, again, from down 64, William and Mary. Um, he teaches courses on colonial North America, African American history, civil rights, and gay and lesbian history. He also serves as the director of WNL's Africana Studies Program. He is a widely respected teacher and scholar who has led educational programs allowing WNL students to experience history on location throughout the southern United States as well as the Caribbean. His work often exam examines the, historic, the history of the segregated American South, and his current projects include writing on school segregation here in Virginia, oral history projects involving extensive interviews with formal, pu former public school students, teachers, and administrators, and examining the manuscripts, newspapers, and school board minutes, as well as the governor's papers, all at the Library of Virginia. He has significant expertise on Jim Crow era, and as well as the taboo of miscegenation. And last but not least, his son is a graduate of WNL who actually practices in Los Angeles. Um, last but not least is our moderator, Andrew Christensen. Mm -hmm. Andrew is our faculty services librarian, where he coordinates um, library support for our faculty scholarly research and instruction, and he's responsible for putting tonight together. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Andrew and say thank you all and welcome. Thank you. And uh, thanks again to, to everyone who's here, and thanks for our panel. Um, so we're at, at about the 7.30 mark. Um, we try to keep this not, uh, not, uh, not, not too much past 8 o'clock. Um, so it's a very uh, uh, straightforward um, endeavor this evening. I think we'll go um, in, a, in an order that I've determined might make uh, sense, um, not exactly the seating order here, uh, but have each of our <coughs> experts um, weigh in with their views, their, uh, their perspectives, um, from the various backgrounds, um, uh, and then we'll open it up, uh, open the floor for interaction. Uh, we can uh, ask questions of uh, of the uh, faculty members here uh, and uh, give our own uh, views as well for the rest of the audience. So um, I've asked Jim to start first. Um, and we're we're going to go for about maybe uh, seven minutes, eight minutes. Or so I can do it, Andrew. Great. Thank you, Jim. Thanks very much. Uh, and thank you so much for having the uh, nice long break of introduction so that I can collect myself after uh, watching the film. Uh, this is probably, I, I know I'm supposed to provide sort of dispassionate uh, legal ethics analysis and all that, but uh, this is probably the 50th time that I've seen this film. Uh, I watched it with my children as they were growing up. They're now 32, 30, and 26. And from the time they were very, very small until they were teenagers and then moving out, this was a movie that we had to watch every year. And we watched it together, the four of us, or however many of them were around at the time. Uh, and of course, in that group, uh, um, some of what we were thinking about as the movie went on was Atticus Finch's father. Uh, not only Atticus Finch's lawyer, but Atticus Finch's father. And, and I have a lot of passion for... Um, uh, for the beauty of the lawyer's role when it's done right. I have a lot of passion for that. And I have a lot of passion for the father's role when it's done right, the parent's role when it's done right. 
And there are a few places in this movie where those two uh, merge, and I never make it through those points without tears. So I really appreciate the few um, light moments in the film, the light scenes, so that I can collect myself and, uh, and have a break from fighting back the tears. So uh, lawyer ethics is, is all about uh, role and relationships. That's what it's really about. We study a bunch of rules. We study a bunch of cases. We study a bunch of law. But fundamentally, it's about the role that lawyers are meant to fill in the society and the justice system. And their role is all about the relationships that they maintain uh, with clients, obviously, with judges, with the public, with witnesses, with everyone that lawyers have to fill some kind of role and have a relationship with. And the quality of those relationships, the quality of those relationships is what actually uh, causes us to admire somebody in the role of lawyer. That's what it really comes down to when you get done with it. So there are a bunch of uh, sort of things going on that we kind of laugh about sometimes or we think about as, as we go through the movie with Atticus and we, uh, we, we kind of might make light of the fact that uh, uh, he acts like a lawyer or what we think a lawyer is supposed to do when he smooth talks, uh, 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 you know, gentle deceptions of Mrs. Dubose on the, on the uh, porch. And we say, oh, he's such a smooth-talking lawyer. That's what lawyers are like. That's how he is, and that's what he's going to do. And, and then, of course, uh, it is a film and a novel, so we have to forgive him when he makes kind of fast and loose uh, uh, relationships with the court rules and the uh, uh, procedural rules and some of the evidence rules and things like that. But those are not interesting to me, uh, even though I'm starting off telling you about those. What's interesting to me in this film is that he represents uh, the classic, admirable lawyer who faces down the most grave conflict of interest that we can all imagine. And, you know, we know, anybody who studied a little bit of professional responsibility law and studied lawyers know, knows that conflicts of interest can come from lots of different directions. It can be that we have two clients whose interests uh, compete with each other. It can be that some third party is trying to influence the lawyer in the way that they behave uh, with respect to their client. Uh, but this one, uh, when the lawyer's own interests come into conflict with the client's interests, and in, for me, again, it's back to father and lawyer, in the most grave way that we can possibly imagine. He sits down on that porch near the beginning of the film when the judge comes to his uh, house and the judge is uh, engaging in a very informal sort of uh, appointment of a lawyer to represent a client uh, in front of that judge's court. And I have to believe that in that moment when the judge is asking him to do this, and, and I think Atticus knows what's coming when the judge approaches his house. He understands what's about to happen. And in that period of time, as the judge is asking him, would he please do this very difficult task, um, he understands that he is in danger. He understands that his children could be in danger. He understands what's going to happen to his family in the, in the ensuing weeks and months and however long this representation takes. But he accepts it and then he does what a lawyer is supposed to do. He represents his client to the fullest the way a lawyer is supposed to do that. There are times in, in uh, the law of professional responsibility when we might say a lawyer who has such a grave conflict of interest ought to not take that representation because they'll be so tempted to do the wrong thing by their client. They'll be so tempted to do what is essentially the easy way out and not endanger their family, endanger their financial interests, whatever it is at play. But here, of course, somebody has to do this. Whoever it is in this community who does what, uh, who gets appointed to this case and does what Atticus is going to do, is going to face the same kind of uh, community community reaction if they do their lawyer role correctly. And so I I love watching the film 
as uh, all of what he has to know is going to happen, happens. Maybe not in the detail, but he knows from the outset this is going to be a very difficult, painful, maybe even dangerous experience for himself and for his family, and yet he does what the lawyer is supposed to do. He does the right thing for his client and does the best job he possibly can. Uh, and, and the couple of moments that sort of merge lawyer and uh, father for me, uh, uh, when the trial ends and the reverend asks his daughter to stand up because, sorry, because her father's passing, that's really hard for me to get through. Uh, and when the neighbor tells his kids, there are some people who are meant to do the hard things, and your father's one of those. So those are some of the moments, as you can tell, that are hard for me to get through. So I'm going to pass the talk now. I did not. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Uh, yeah. yeah. So you're uh, very, very emotional. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I found myself uh, Sorry. choking up. It's been a long time since I'd seen that movie. I think for a lot of us, we've seen it before and, and read the book. But um, yeah, in particular, in, in when, it's, when it's rendered in, in film mm -hmm. like that, uh, it is, it is uh, pretty powerful. All right, so I'm going to ask Mark Connor to speak next from our English department and our, and our associate provost. All right, thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Caroline, for setting this. I, I just think it's a fabulous idea to, to uh, see the film and talk a little bit about this book. And, and I just want to make a few comments about this book in the context of American literature. Uh, it's, it's a remarkable book, and the book is many things. It is, it is Southern Gothic. It is a coming-of-age tale. Uh, it's a nascent text of the Civil Rights Movement and is probably the classic of the law and literature movement. And another thing that it is, is a remarkable example of the voice of the child in American literature. And we Americans are fascinated by the child. It's the defining figure in so much of our national writing. Think of Little Pearl in The Scarlet Letter. Uh, if Hester Prynne's Scarlet A is the mark of her in Dimsdale's sin, Little Pearl is the mark of their redemption. Or think of little Eva in Stowe's very complex work, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Even our adult heroes are children. Gatsby, after all, wants to go back to a state of innocence, much like that of a child. And then the most famous child narrator of them all, Mark Twain's remarkable Huckleberry Finn. And part of what makes Huck so important is that he is both the narrator and the main character of his own story. Twain is able to give us the words, the speech, the perspective of a child, while at the same time rendering the moral vision of an adult, which sounds a lot like what Harper Lee pulls off in having young Scout narrate and star in the novel. Hers is the voice we hear, and hers is the conscience we witness as it develops. And Twain's model is everywhere in Harper Lee's book. What does Huck stand for? in his own narrative. He is the only one who sympathizes with Jim, the escaped slave. He is the only one who perceives Jim as a fully rounded human being, as a father, as a husband, as a good man. A realization that even surprises Huck himself, which reveals to us the extent of his society's wickedness. That it has convinced him that Jim should be returned to slavery even though it goes against every fiber of Huck's moral character. And so in that novel's great moral climax, Huck resolves that he will go to hell rather than return Jim to the slave catchers. His resistance to society's evil is so strong that it can overcome the lessons that society itself has inculcated in Huck. Now Ralph Ellison, arguably the greatest African-American novelist ever, understood the profound moral teaching of Twain's novel. And in an essay written in the late 40s, he said, Jim is not simply a slave, he is a symbol of humanity. And in freeing Jim, Huck makes a bid to free himself of the conventionalized evil taken for civilization by the tag. And through this remarkably daring representation of the black man, and recall that Twain's novel was published in 1884, right when Reconstruction was receding and the evils of Jim Crow were beginning. Twain established the standard for the moral voice in the American novel. Ellison concludes, Jim represents Twain's acceptance of his personal responsibility in the condition of society. 
This was the tragic face behind his comic madness. Now, this is extraordinarily resonant with Harper Lee's great novel. Scout becomes this moral voice, all the more poignant because, like Huck, she is essentially powerless. Her role is to witness to Tom's humanity and to sound the cry of his freedom, a cry that in the novel goes tragically unheard, but that we, the readers, hear. And the fact of the novel's incredible popularity, it sold over 30 million copies, most widely read book in America for young readers between ages uh, grades 9 and 12, suggests that we as readers are eager to hear this cry. Scout is the innocent child who is forced to confront a rather horrifying catalog of American sins. Racial <coughs> prejudice and injustice, yes, but also the suggestion of incest between Mayella Yule and her father, the ostracism of Boo Radley, stark class differences, gender repression. It's funny when she's forced to wear the dress, but it's also a sense of the constraints that are going to be put upon this remarkable child as she grows. The fact is we in American culture ask an awful lot of our children. We ask them to carry our moral burdens, to return us to a state of innocence, to redeem our sinfulness, even or especially that greatest of American sins, the history of slavery and oppression that we can track throughout the American experiment. Twain puts this burden on Huck. Faulkner puts it on Isaac McCaslin. Salinger puts it on Holden Caulfield. Alice Walker puts it on Seeley. Harper Lee puts it on Young Scout. And so in one compelling reading of the novel, Scout's perspective and Scout's resolution become the chief concern of the book. We can say that the great question of the novel is really not will Tom Robinson be found innocent or guilty. No, the question is what effect will all this have on Young Scout? For as she goes, so goes the nation and so go ourselves. She is the embodiment of America's relentless urge to think of itself as somehow always innocent. Now having said that, let me push back with another reading. Let me assert that Lee's great question is precisely whether or not Tom Robinson will find justice or find death. The novel is written in the years 1957 to 1960 by an author from Monroeville, Alabama equidistant between Mobile and Montgomery. We know about the historical context of the late 50s and early 60s. We know about Emmett Till and the Scottsboro Boys. And on the horizon of Lee's achievement is the civil rights movement, the emergence of black power, the long hot summer of 68, and that terrible transformative time of riot, assassination, and a day of reckoning for much of American culture. And Lee understands at some level, and we certainly see this with historical hindsight, that her novel is emerging from the crucible of race in America. And this means that its moral barometer is inevitably this, what will happen to the black man in this book? To return to Ralph Ellison, who seems to me still the most insightful commentator America has ever produced on its long agon with race. Ellison insists that the test of the great American novel is how faithfully, boldly, and with how much complexity that novel approaches what he calls our tragicomic history, and particularly our history of white and black. Such boldness, he claims, define the great 19th century novelists like Twain and Melville. But in the 20th century, he says, that boldness flagged as we turned away from our racial dilemmas and sought an easier path. Well, not so, Harper Lee. She shows us the failure of one Southern community to face its history and its sins, and she shows us the astonishing bravery of a few of its members, whose efforts perhaps can redeem that community, or if not redeem it, at least provide us with some hope that it could one day be redeemed. So to conclude, we can claim that ultimately the great achievement of Lee's novel is a stylistic one. By bringing together the voice of a child and the moral perspective of a mature writer, Lee manages to have her cake and eat it too. The innocence with which Scout sees the world and the sharp critique with which Harper Lee sees it. 
What the novel forces us to do is to see the world through Scout's eyes. And if we read carefully, to see ourselves through the demanding eyes of the child. This is the subtle lesson of the novel, and indeed of all novels, to broaden one's perspective, to step into the point of view of another, to see the world through her eyes. And this is a large part of why we read novels in the first place. And of course, Atticus is the one who tells us this. When he famously tells Scout, you never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb into his skin and walk around in it. This is the novel's great teaching. If only we could all so freely inhabit one another's skin. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, and, and great uh, comparative uh, perspective there. Um, those are the great American works. Thank you so much. And uh, for, his, for another historical perspective, I'm hoping that Ted Delaney will share uh, our resident historian will share his views. First, I'd like to think about the 30s, the 1930s. The novel is set during the Great Depression. And the South has a harder time coming out of the Depression, and people in the rural South suffer worse than people in most of the rest of the nation do. Nobody has any money. Uh, Atticus Finch doesn't have any money. But then there are people like the Cunninghams and certainly the black families there that don't have money either. Also, the one thing we have to think about is Jim Crow. In the background of this, there's an all-white jury. But there's an all-white jury because there's been disfranchisement of black people beginning roughly around 1900 and coming forward. So there are no black people on the voting rolls in a place like Alabama, and jurors come from the voting rolls. So no one understands the setting any better than Harper Lee. The same is true in Faulkner novels, where you can look at Lee and you can look at Faulkner and you understand how well they understand the complexities of race in the South. I want to come forward now. Harper Lee's book was published on the 11th of July, 1960, at the beginning of a very important decade. Some people think the civil rights movement came out of nowhere. That's wrong. It was born. The earliest civil rights organization was founded in 1890, not in 1960. But most people only know the civil rights movement of the 60s. And so that year that this novel comes out, it comes out about six months after four students at North Carolina A&T decide to sit in at the lunch counter at Woolworths. A week later, I'm sorry, two weeks later, you have the students at Fisk University who begin sit-ins. Two months before this novel comes out, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee comes into being. So this is the beginning of the 1960s Civil Rights Movement. As all of this unrest is beginning with regard to black resistance in the South, there's something else that's happening in the background. 1960 is the beginning of the centennial of the Civil War. A lot of people have been looking forward to this. The centennial of the Civil War, incidentally, sort of resurrects the Confederate flag that had almost died in most places. And so it comes sort of back out and into full prominence. But it's the only thing about the Civil War that anybody seems to pay attention to during the 1960s, because the Civil Rights Movement overshadows the centennial of the Civil War, pushes it away from the front page of newspapers, or from television news. Ironically, however, <coughs> Harper Lee claims to be a descendant of Robert E. Lee. And so you've got this odd thing that's happening historically with the centennial of the Civil War on one hand, and the height of the Civil Rights Movement on the other. To Kill a Mockingbird brings a story 
to us that is all too familiar in the history of the New South. And this is a story of fear, fear of black-white relations where sex may be involved. The novel comes out five years after Emma Till's murder. Once again, a similar kind of plot where you've got a 14-year-old boy from Chicago who's accused of talking fresh to Carolyn Bryant, who is the proprietor of the grocery store, the country store, if you will, in Money, Mississippi. Carolyn's husband, Roy, and his half-brother uh, go out to get Emmett Till to teach him a lesson. Uh, they kill him. They stand trial. An all-white jury, uh, all jury finds them not guilty. But one month later, they sell their story to uh, they sell their story to a reporter who publishes it in Look magazine. They sell the story for four thousand dollars, in which they freely tell how they murdered Emmett Till. And of course, double jeopardy protects them from being tried again. The story also, because it happened in the 30s, the story is also inspired by the trial of the Scottsboro brothers. And there's some scholars who look at the similarities between what happens in the trial in To Kill a Mockingbird and the trial uh, of the Scottsboro brothers. So there are these incredible parallels, if you will, and important parallels. I have a great deal of admiration for Harper Lee because it seems to me that coming from the part of Alabama that she comes from, it took a lot of courage to write this book. It also makes me wonder a great deal about her because on her webpage, there's the descendant of Robert E. Lee thing. So there's also that dimension and the struggle that we painfully aware of in Lexington, where people seem to think that they know what Robert E. Lee wants, particularly on this campus. So my hat goes off to Harper Lee, and, uh, and I thank Andrew and Caroline for doing this. This has been a lot of uh, fun for me. Well, thank you, Ted. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, great historical perspective. Um, there's some, um, you, know, you made reference to some very important events around that same time, it definitely influenced her writing and um, things that still, to this day, I know we, we learn about you teaching. <coughs> so, very important part of history. And then that, that part that you had actually just told me just earlier this evening about that she had been related to, <coughs> claims to be related to a descendant of Robert E. Lee, direct descendant, that's interesting. So, I'll have to look more into that. All right, so um, last, uh, Professor LaRue, uh, who had actually was a practitioner, as I understand, um, a legal practitioner in the South, of uh, the U.S. Justice Department uh, during the 1960s, and I'm, I'm hoping he'll share with us uh, some, some interesting perspectives um, in that respect. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that struck me uh, immediately, I don't know how many of you, uh, was the jury was out two hours. Uh, that's a long, long time. Uh, I prosecuted a policeman uh, from Canton, Mississippi, and I kept the jury out for 45 minutes before they acquitted. Obviously not as good as Atticus. <laughs> uh, and my heart, my colleagues uh, thought I had uh, performed heroically and magnificently or to have kept them out that long. Um, it was a tough business. Um, Atticus did have a tough job. Uh, he had a better judge than most of them I appeared before, uh, who could fairly be described as at best toads. Uh, <laughs> but uh, he also uh, exemplified uh, a, a lesson um, that I knew uh, was true, which the utter respect with which he treats everybody, even the toads. In fact, uh, the more, uh, or I'm put it, the less re deserving of respect uh, your judge and your opponent are, 
the more respect you must accord them. Or otherwise, you go down to their level and you become as dirty as they are. I think that's exemplified most beautifully in his cross-examinations. Notice how gently he dealt with the obvious lines. He never did any of this kind of Perry Mason kind of stuff. Um, and and um, there are a thousand good reasons uh, for that courtesy toward the witness. Never abusing the witness for the lies, but just hoping you're weaving a web in which they themselves will do the harm to themselves. Um, but one of the reasons is um, you cannot ever permit yourself as a cross-examiner to become the antagonist of the witness. Because once a fight gets started, people take sides. And who's the jury going to take sides with? You, wearing a suit, speaking good English, obviously upper middle class, or the poor slob who's lying because he has no better way of getting through the world, and whose social class and clothes and speech and way of being is exactly the same as that group of jurors. So if you put them into a position where you start a fight, people take sides in fights. You can't expect them to take your side because you're not their kind of people. So you have to treat that witness with the utmost respect. And in making the argument, Atticus does not argue to the prejudice jury and in my case, when I had to make arguments, the obviously prejudiced judge. He argues to whom they should be. You argue to the ideal judge, despite the fact that you were for a judge who is <laughs> way far south of ideal. And you're arguing to the ideal jury, despite the fact you were before a jury that cannot be called ideal because you'll only get some justice, some chance of getting justice, if they leave off the people they are, the persona they are, and enact the persona they should be. And miracles happen. Not this day, not that, not, not most days, but I had a miracle happen once and most lot of us lawyers who practiced, in my case, Mississippi, 1965, 1964 was the long hot summer. Uh, that was the summer that Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman were killed by Sheriff Rainey Deputy Price and other law enforcement officers of the show in Mississippi. I worked a small piece of the grand jury role in that case, a very minor footnote at best. Um, but we won that one in the end. And um, the show was not the same place it was. No paradise now. Never will be a paradise, but it's better. Um, so sometimes a small miracle can happen. Okay. Well, thank you uh, uh, to all of our panelists. Um, I, I guess that's actually. I think <laughs> All right.
so um, we'd like to open up the floor for uh, questions, comments, um, people's perspectives. Yes, ma'am. Speaking of miracles, was there any hope whatsoever had Tom Robinson lived for an appeal? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the odds would be against it, but uh, the, uh, I, I think it's true in Alabama then and now. Uh, the uh, court can always say um, there's not sufficient evidence to convict. And uh, certainly in this case there was not. Uh, the verdict against the manifest weight of the evidence is another phrase that is often used. So mean? yeah, it, it was... Uh, what does that mean, Lash? What? What does that mean for a layperson? Explain what that means. Uh, you got to be daft to return that jury, uh, that verdict, or more accurately, uh, the jury's verdict shows a disregard for the law. Uh, if if the jury's verdict shows that, uh, then 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 you have grounds for saying that the the, the euphemism that I used. And you can repeat that with a straight face. <laughs> but, man, he couldn't go back home if he had won on appeal, not in the 1930s no. in Alabama. The only way he would have survived would have, to have left Alabama completely. And who could afford to resettle in the 1930s in some place that would be safe and out of the South? So. It's a no-win situation, at least historically. I was just curious, since we have the legal experts, I was curious from the legal perspective. I, to, I to, give it a, that, to give so. it a literary reading, I think Lee let him die with the only freedom he was going to get. Mm -hmm. you know, he, he's, he's running, and that's how, that's how he goes. Fresh times again. Um, there are so many things that could be said about the book, and we heard four great perspectives, and I, I could talk about all of them, but um, I sort of thought I'd throw this at Jim and say there are two lawyers in this movie, not one, three if you come to Jim. Right. And we spend a lot of time talking about Atticus and his function, his role, mm -hmm. his ethical model. But there's a prosecutor there, too. And this was not, this is an individual story, but there is a whole system of oppression in which the law and lawyers and judges are deeply embedded for many, many, many decades. And so I wonder if you would talk a little bit about the prosecutor and what a prosecutor does when a victim and a witness come sure. and say there's been a crime and the prosecutor may have reason not to believe. So if I can take him out of 1930s Alabama for a minute and just talk about what a prosecutor in that set of circumstances would do when the evidence that uh, he received was so flawed, was uh, uh, so obviously uh, corrupted itself, in one way or another. Uh, the proper thing for a prosecutor to do that at that point is to dismiss the charges and not pursue the charges. So, uh, you know, we think sometimes of a prosecutor as, as just being another lawyer and, you know, he or she is supposed to fight hard and win the way that a uh, defense lawyer tries to fight hard and win. And uh, I think inside, a lot of prosecutors adopt that persona, right, and they do that. But what they forget about sometimes is that they represent, uh, they don't represent any individual. They represent uh, the entity of the state. So they represent the public. They're supposed to represent a client, the state of Alabama or whatever it happens to be, that by its very nature is public abiding, right? So they are not supposed to just try to win. And there are lots of cases that give the terms of phrase for that. Uh, without using any of them, the prosecutor is representing a client who is public abiding and is supposed to act in and not in the interest of winning. So 
from the outset, this prosecutor should have brought these charges and pursued them. When I watch the movie, I'm actually, there's a, there's a strange pattern in the prosecutor's behavior. So get past the moment where he shouldn't have brought the charges in the first place. Now he's in a trial and he's, and he's presenting the evidence. And, and at least for me, it looks like he presents the evidence in a very half-hearted way, right? As if he doesn't believe it either. He doesn't feel comfortable with what's happening either. And when he finally rises, right, to the, to the bait of the prejudice, to the bait of who he may be as a person, to the bait of what his society says, is when he's cross-examining uh, Tom. And, and until that point in, in his behavior, he seems like a prosecutor who's not that excited about winning. Uh, but then everything turns, and and suddenly this uh, this relationship that you know that who he is would have with who Tom is takes over everything else, and he becomes this person who fiercely has to uh, demonstrate that Tom is not a deserving human being for uh, this, this uh, statement about feeling sorry for um, uh, male Yule. So he behaves in strange ways to me as I watch him. Number one, he shouldn't have brought these charges. That's an easy thing to say as a lawyer ethics matter. Um, and then he behaves in kind of contradictory ways during the trial itself. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, I guess I have a question following up on what Jim just said for Lash. Um, I know we talked in general about the ills of the system, but when you were in individual trials, did you see your opponents struggling with those sort of ethical dilemmas, or did you feel like they were um, not struggling in the way that they should? But they, should we really be defending this person? Should I? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm. The last time I served as a defense counsel was when I was in the Marine Corps mm -hmm. uh, participating in court martials, and I won a couple cases, so there may be a prosecutor. And then when I went for the Justice Department, of course, I was obviously a prosecutor. So I spent my whole life as a prosecutor. My whole life as a trial lawyer uh, was a prosecutor. And um, I, I agree with everything uh, our expert on ethics has said. Uh, but I don't know if you had a, a different existential question you wanted to ask. Well, I just wondered if you could detect some sort of ethical ambiguity in your opponents, the people that were defending the... I understood that you were mostly prosecuting civil rights crimes, right? Well, um, the ethical problem uh, for defense counsel is, is totally different, uh, and I certainly felt it. Uh, 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 Popular imagination says it's hard to defend a guilty person. That's not true. The government has so many advantages in prosecution that if they can't convict a guilty person, it's their fault, and I bear no blame for getting the guy off, which I got a couple guys off, it shouldn't have been gotten off. The real hell is to defend an innocent man. I mean, if, if you've never done that, uh, you've been lucky. There's nothing worse because too many innocent people get convicted, and it's always in the back of your mind, that's my fault. That's what's difficult. And, uh, but I'm sorry. No, I think I agree. Yes, Jim. How the sheriff feels? Is that the sheriff? Or yeah, yeah. Know? Well, uh, yeah, the marshal or sheriff, whatever he is. Uh, how does he feel about it? No, how do you feel? How did I feel about the sheriff? Well, first of all, he's not a lawyer. So I, I, I study lawyer ethics, and I'm not that smart about uh, capital E ethics and morality and so forth. But So he's not a lawyer, so I don't have any professional ethics opinion about his behavior. Um, it, it's hard not to love what he does. 
That's helpful. <laughs> Please. I dealt with sheriffs uh, throughout the South. And what he did is exactly what they do. Um, and where do I put it? Um, who, who is the client uh, for the sheriff? Um, when I practiced law in the South, it was the local business community. And uh, so the sheriff's main job is uh, to prevent windows from being broken, uh, to keep the peace in the most fundamental way. And the peace could be, in many cases like this one, the moral peace. Their compass is not the law. Their compass is peace. And the various many meanings that that would have. So uh, I was not surprised by his behavior. I dealt with many of the sheriff was like that. So I'll just say that I think what this sheriff did was distrust the law. He wanted justice to happen. And he had already been a witness, uh, a very close witness, to an event where justice was not done, going through the legal procedures. And he basically made up his mind, probably correctly, about what the just result would be to this event. And he decided to bypass law and get there on his own. And I, I kind of feel good about what he does. I'm afraid, you know. Yeah. Maybe it's also commentary on, on the, his his perception of the likelihood that justice yeah. would actually yeah. Yeah. be. Yeah, and of course the problem she, with the problem with even having a moment when you feel good about what he did was that you all also understand that in his setting there are going to be ninety nine uh, and nine tenths percent of the times when he's going to bypass law for the wrong result, <laughs> and so it's hard to be sort of heartened by the one time that he bypasses law for the right result. So, so you have this kind of pull inside you when you think, oh, he's going to do the right thing here, it's great. And then you think, wow, if they act like this on their own and make these decisions on their own, I'll bet they're usually not doing the right thing. So that's, that's the ambivalence in his, his conduct for me. Okay, um, we got a couple more questions, and maybe these will be the last two, unless people want to hang around a little bit longer. But uh, yes? Okay, so we've talked a lot about the trial and a lot about the racial aspect of this book, rightly. Um, but I'm wondering if any of you can speak in the larger story context of the treatment of Bo throughout the story and how maybe that relates to um, the treatment of Tom. I think that's a great question. He's, he's such an enigmatic character. He's unseen until the very end. Uh, uh, there are fantasies being woven about him, about what he is. There's a big part of the Southern Gothic part of it. The haunted house, the mysterious figure. What does he stand for? Does he stand for the past? Does he stand for this threatening figure? Uh, you've got the rabid dog that's trying to enter the community. You've got all these things trying to invade. And he's seen, I think, up until near the end, we start to suspect he's not quite the way he's being coded, but he seems to be this figure of, of evil and, and dark portent. And then we get this revelation, right, that he's there, you know, he and Atticus are the two who are there to protect the children. And, and the children are the moral center of, of the book and of the film. So it transforms Bo into the very opposite of what we thought he was going to be. And, and I think that's kind of a skeleton key for understanding a lot of the book, that there's this, you know, Harper Lee famously said she wanted to be the Jane Austen of the South. And Jane Austen is really all about showing us this richly textured social veneer and then showing how that occludes our vision. The reality is we have to learn how to decode the way things appear to be. Uh, and I think Harper Lee is operating in the same way, and, and so Bo becomes this emblem for that. We think he's one way, it turns out he is another, and then we try to apply that, right? Like, like Atticus's advice to all these other characters throughout the book. So I, I, I think it's, it's a great question to think about the way that enigmatic character functions. It's also very, very southern. I mean, growing up in Lexington, there were characters like him <laughs> in Lexington growing up. And some people who've been here long enough know who those characters were. <laughs> yep. And people kept them at home. Uh, people kept them out of, as the, as the story says, out of the asylum. But it's a very, very southern thing to have characters like that in the community. Mm -hmm. And everybody has legends about those characters. 
Fascinating. Carol. So I want to take the last question because I want to tease Harper Lee's new manuscript. So um, for those of you who haven't seen the press release, I think the AP has one out. And um, so I'll direct my question to you, Mark. The press release says today that um, the manuscript that they'll be publishing um, in several months is actually the first manuscript that she wrote, uh, set in 1950s Alabama, that had flashbacks of Scout, which when the um, when the publishers first read it, they said, oh, right, Scout story, and that became to kill Mockingbird. So I'm curious, what do you think about this um, new manuscript? I mean, it was, such, it was such a bomb to have that, go, and today of all days, it was just <laughs> extraordinary. I got the email from Andrew, my first thought was, yeah, yeah right, another, another <laughs> hoax about Harper Lee. You know, she's she's not quite as extreme as Salinger, but but there you know, just this incredible delay, like with Ralph Ellison. You know, what is she? Is there going to be another book? When uh, and and always refusing, and she was still in the public eye, unlike Salinger, but but refusing to comment about her book. She never wrote an introduction to the book, despite all this. The publishers would have loved an intro because then they could have reissued the book. Uh, very silent, and then to find out there is this other book. And yet, it's one that she wrote 50 years ago. It's, it's a very, I can't think of a, a comparable example, except when somebody dies and posthumously, you know, this, this unfinished manuscript is brought up. But she's bringing it out while she's still alive. It's, a, it's really intriguing. Uh, we were talking earlier, you know, they're, they're saying, well, we're just going to do a first release of two million copies. You know, two million. I mean, nobody sells that many books. I mean, kudos for her, right? I mean, why not bring it out? I mean, she's 88. Bring it out before she goes and uh, see what the world makes of it. It's going to be a, a splash, that's for sure. There is an excellent book on um, Harper Lee. It's called the, Mocking, the Mockingbird Next Door. At the, uh, about four or five years ago, it, it's a very recent book, mm -hmm. uh, a young woman reporter from Chicago was the first reporter, for reasons we, the woman herself doesn't know, uh, that Harper Lee talked to. And uh, the young woman becomes sick. She moves to the hometown, becomes good friends with Harper, her older sister Alice, who carries on the father's practice. Uh, Atticus is modeled on her father. Dill next door neighbor was Truman Capote as a young man. Mm -hmm. uh, but by the way, don't rely on anything uh, you ever read that Truman Capote says about this or anything else, even the story is and it's documented, well documented. But anyway, if you want to know the between now and the novel coming out, you want to know about Harper Lee and the town and her character, I can't recommend this book too highly. It's so one well, we should say Harper Lee has, has rejected that book as being authoritative. Mm -hmm. It was written with her cooperation, but then she said, no, no, this, yeah. she's, she's disclaimed the book. So she's, she plays a complicated game with her public persona. It's been very interesting. <laughs> I think we might have another Debbie Nell Reeves when that one comes out. <laughs> <laughs> we might have the, the movie, though. I don't know what the movie is. <laughs> <laughs> that might be another way for that. I'm sure they're off with yeah. right. <laughs>